Record. Hi, this is David Gewertz, and it's time for DIY IT's Better Know a Blogger. Today, my guest is Alfred Poor, and we'll be talking about wearables, health, fitness, and all sorts of good stuff. trying to. There we go. Okay. Alfred, let's bring you on. There we go. Hey, Alfred, how are you? Welcome back. I'm doing great. You? I am good. So uh, we're going to talk about all sorts of, of good stuff about wearables and health and all that stuff. But why don't you uh, bring us up to date with what you're working on, where you're working on it at, and all that good stuff. Sure. Well, um, I... Uh, earlier this summer, I started a, on a new project uh, for Center Ring Media, uh, and it's called uh, Health Tech Insider, healthtechinsider.com, and it's a, uh, a, a new website and a newsletter, uh, and basically it's a spinoff from Center Ring's initial newsletter called Wearable Tech Insider, and where that is just about all things wearable, uh, I'm taking a look at wearable technology beyond the, the fitness band. So technology that advances on fitness but goes into health and medical kinds of applications as well. And so it's a, a, a daily blog and a weekly newsletter, email newsletter that we send out. And it's growing great and we're having a lot of fun with it. Cool. So does that mean if it's if it's centering media that it's a kind of a circus? Uh, oh, it is always a circus. Dan, Dan Rosenbaum, I don't know if you know Dan, but He's another no. Ziff Davis alumni, um, uh, as I, as am I, and uh, he as and I worked I. together in Computer Shopper. Ah, a, a few few ages, a few lifetimes ago, but uh, it's great to be working with him on another project, and so having a lot of fun with that. So tell us a couple minutes, uh, a couple seconds about Centering Media before we go into uh, our main discussion. I'm not too familiar with that brand. Well, again, it's Dan Rosenbaum's project mm -hmm. and it's essentially um, a, a content marketing and publishing operation. Uh, he's got a couple newsletters of his own but he also does uh, uh, work content work for, for client companies as well. Got it, got it. So let's talk a little bit about this uh, internet of things and uh, devices and connections and all that kind of stuff. I got an email yesterday. I have a little why things um, uh, blood pressure cuff that I don't use often enough um, mm -hmm. to, to report things back to the doc. And um, I got an email from them yesterday about a gadget. I think they called it an arrow, uh, which has some lights that pulse and a thing that goes under your bed. And, you know, we're, we're starting to see um, on, on, on John Stewart last night, there was a, uh, uh, a medical bottle with... Um, you know, a ring of light that would text you and remind you when you're supposed to take your, your, your medicine and all that good stuff. What are, are we seeing? Is, is this like just gadgets? Is there anything real in all this stuff? Um, where do we stand here? Well, it, it, it's, it's a good question. And um, if you look at the, uh, the analyst forecasts about the wearable markets, um, we're seeing the typical hockey stick projections where things are supposed to just take off, you know, rapidly into the stratosphere. And we've seen that with the Fitbit and other fitness, uh, fitness tracking kind of wearables, wrist, wristbands that people are wearing. But if you look a little, just a little deeper at the data, you discover that uh, the vast bulk of the money in this, uh, in this market, at least in the near term, is going to be in health and medical. Uh, it reminds me of you know the old apocryphal quote from Willie Sutton, the bank robber, when they asked him why do you rob banks, and uh, reportedly his answer was because that's where the money is. Well, if you're looking to make money out of wearables, the place to look for it now is in health and wellness, um, and it's it's a, a very exciting collision between technology and social and big data 
and just a whole bunch of really fascinating trends. And, and it's going to transform the way we do many things um, uh, in, in the next 10, 20 years. And I, I believe it's going to help lower costs, improve the quality of life, extend um, life expectancy. It's it just going to do a lot of really excellent, wonderful things for people. You know, Denise and I were talking last night. I, I don't know if you know that my wife's an RN, and um, she's also covered tech stuff for, for um, in fact, for, for Ziff Davis and, and ZDNet. She, she and I are also both old Ziff Davis folks, and uh, uh, I think everybody I know is, <laughs> at least sometime in the last 30 years. Um, but we were talking about this, and there there are certainly two sides to to the benefits. I mean, on one hand, there's the the benefit of how this thing can prolong life, but isn't there also the 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 thing that scares people? Your insurance company might decide, oh, you missed a dose of your pill, and therefore you're no longer going to be covered, or they're going to penalize you, or you know, some form of Big Brother is going to watch. I mean, aren't we looking at two sides of a of a sword? Yeah, and always technology. I mean, you know, you you go back to Nobel and dynamite, and we we've, we've had, you know, the same problem, that technology is not inherently good or evil. It's it's how you apply it, um, and no doubt there's with a lot of this this health and wellness kind of technology, wearable or otherwise, there's certainly room for abuse for misuse um and, and just simply the law of unintended consequences reaching out and grabbing you um one of the big issues right now uh that people have is uh well in, in workplaces in the corporate environment right now one of the big issues is bring your own device you know if i i come in with my own smartphone and there's data on it does that data belong to my employer does it belong to me or who's got control over it well, we're going to see that in spades with these health and fitness and devices that are recording information about your body. And the question is, who's going to own that? Um, when you go see the doctor, your medical records belong to the practice. Um, the, we have laws in place now that, that govern how that information can be shared, HIPAA, if you're familiar with it. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> and that extends to the, the kinds of data that it's going to could be shared in a in a clinical kind of environment based on this stuff. But just the simple information about how far you walk today or what your heart rate has been looking like all day during while you work or those kinds of things. There's a lot that we don't know yet about how these this information can be used, how it can be abused, um, what information should be put out there still attached to your personal information what should be stripped of personal identifiers so that it can be used in aggregate aggregate um, because it's in that aggregate use where the huge benefits lie yeah um, talk to big data proponents and just being able to to i mean right now for most for the average american they may go see the doctor for a you know a wellness checkup once or twice you know once every year or two, um, so you're getting you know very small static little bits of data, with this wearable technology to be able to find find out information about heart rate, uh, blood oxygen level, uh, amount of exercise, the kind of exercise you're doing, um, and and have information like that longitudinally over over a 24 hour period throughout the year, is going to just be enormously valuable when they can correlate that with onset of diabetes, heart disease, different kinds, you know, uh, some of the, the joint problems, you know, whatever. There's, it's going to give researchers a much richer data set to work from. Yeah, you've also got things like being able to map disease vectors, you know, being able to map it based, I mean, we're, we're looking at this Ebola thing, which is, is, is pretty scary. Um, but you know, even things like flu vectors. I, th I think Google even a couple of years ago did a did a, a site where they mapped where flu searches were, and based on the the search criteria and where the flu searches were, they could begin to get a feel for where there might be larger outbreaks of flu and over a period of time. It's so on that context. I mean, there's there's the really exciting side of things. And then there's the, the, the worrisome side of things. And so I'm, I'm going to get to the really exciting stuff in a second because I think there's okay. a lot there. 
But I want to ask, how should people think about this? Should they try these things out? Should they avoid using them because their doctor might send information to insurance companies? I mean, what's the what's the 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 think that people should have about this new technology as it's getting started? At this point, it's really easy. Um, for the most part, not much is being done with this information. In fact, it's it's difficult for most people to even share their information with their doctors. Um, there are people who just naturally are comfortable sharing information. You just look at your friends on Facebook and some of the things that they're willing to share. <laughs> um, yeah. So for some people, it's, it, it's not an issue. And for other people who are more cautious about it, they're not, for the most part, they're not going to be put in a position where they have to make choices. They, they can opt. It's still easy to opt out of this. Um, the fact is that a lot of larger corporations are experimenting uh, with this kind of information and are, for the most part at this point, still using volunteers, but are purchasing some of these products for their employees to wear and using that data in conjunction with their health insurance providers or if they're self-insuring for, for health insurance, using that information to analyze worker habits and, and try to project costs and look for ways to reduce uh, medical costs and that sort of thing. Um, so I think it's depending on who you work for, depending on your, your personal circumstances, I think the day is coming when it'll be harder to opt out. But at this point, uh, if you're concerned about this sort of thing, you really shouldn't have any fear about being forced to divulge information that you don't want to don't want to share. So then let's talk about, about what's cool. Um, you know, we're, we're looking at, uh, my wife has a, has a, one of the Android wear. She doesn't use it for much yet, but she's got it. She thought it was really, really neat. And, yeah. you know, <laughs> uh, it can tell her heart rate, which is kind of good for exercise and stuff like that. Um, but what can we do with these things? What's, what's the, sure. what's the cool factor for these devices today, both in terms of health and, and otherwise? I mean, cause not everybody's going to pony up a couple hundred bucks just because it'll tell your heart rate. What else is there to these things? Well, um, for the most part, the, the the kinds of consumer products that you can get now are stupid. <laughs> yeah. They are. You know, they kind of tell you your heart rate. Um, the tests that have been done on them as pedometers or activity meters, they're the best of them are about ten percent accurate. The worst are about 20% accurate, which is, you know, not great, you know, as a, in terms of, you know, scientific accuracy, but it's close enough to get a ballpoint, ballpark figure as to, you know, what kind of exercise you're getting and how you're doing. Um, the thing that excites me is that the products that are available now and are, that are coming for serious medical and serious health kinds of applications. Let's take one example, diabetes. Um, for someone with diabetes these days, type two diabetes, uh, they have to do a finger prick to get a small blood sample. Um, they have to use, uh, fortunately they can now use a, a fairly inexpensive home uh, blood test machine that gives them a, a blood analysis very quickly, but there are consumables involved. And it gives you one data point whenever you do the, the, the blood draw. And, you know, so you, depending on your situation, you might have to do that a number of times a day to figure out the correct insulin dosage. That's a pain and it's, right. it's a problem and it can be difficult for some patients to comply effectively with the testing and with the dosage and with the timings and, and all the rest of it. Uh, there are a lot of companies out there that are doing some very exciting things where with a, a, a wristband, uh, you could have a band that would optically look through your skin to your blood vessels and be able to analyze the blood as it passes through um, and measure your blood sugar level non-invasively. And by doing so, it can take res measurements you know, every minute and actually be able to track your levels on a much finer detail 
throughout the day. So how sci-fi is that? Is that is that do we have oh, this the tech is now? Or? This this is this is this is products that are uh, some of these products are are in clinical trials now. Okay. So I mean we're we're we could be talking two or three years out before we see a, a commercial product. But again, one of the interesting things is that the FCC, I mean, the FDA has uh, put out guidelines that appear to be much more relaxed about what's going to need the really serious high level certification that medical devices typically would have to go through. Do you think this is um, going to become some kind of snake oil where everybody is selling an iWatch and you know, every one of them can provide information and the data is is really rough? Or do you think that this thing is going to be potentially more accurate because it's it's easier to provide quality data when you're programming than not? There are two pieces, important pieces to that question. Um, one is uh, absolutely the information is going to become more readily available and uh, there's going to be enough products that are good enough there will be a lot of competition in in the marketplace, and that's going to help bring costs down. Uh, the other half of the coin, though, is that we're going to need standards. We're going to need some serious standard bodies to uh, be able to adequately test these products to make sure that they're measuring what they say they're measuring, um, and they can do so reliably over time. And that's not a trivial problem at all. Um, one of the big parts of wearable health technology that's out there that's caught a lot of attention lately is in sports, there's a lot of concern about repetitive uh, trauma to the head and concussions and, and, and the cumulative effects of blows to the head. And it's, it's not just for football, um, but uh, it's also for soccer and it's for everybody from the youth players all the way up through the professionals. Um, I, the NFL has had some very public lawsuits about this recently. So it's, it's been in, in people's, in my, uh, in their mind, uh, about sport in general. Well, there are a number of companies that make devices that will track over time, the forces that uh, a player's head is subjected to. Um, and there's one that you, know, you could put on under the football helmet and it glows when the, the player you know, has hit, taken too many hits and should be taken out of the game. Um, part of the problem is uh, how do you determine who's measuring it, you know, you know, who's, what they're measuring and whether that's accurate and whether there's any scientific accuracy to, to the information it's providing. Uh, and in that case, there is an industry group that is uh, doing testing and certification of the products. But one of the problems is that it's only testing for certain kinds of blows and, and, and not others. And another problem is it's tightly, <laughs> it's tightly affiliated with one of the companies that invented some of the technology. Yeah, yeah. So I there's a bit of conflict of interest. I can kind of so, see a Running Man thing going on there, where you know the 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 film is delayed by two seconds, and you know if a head trauma shows up on on somebody's head, all of a sudden the camera film that's where you know you get an automatic tight focus on it, and you know now players are trying to go for the head trauma because they get more film time. I mean, you know these things could yeah, be silly could at happen. some point. It, it it really could. It really could. So let's just let's it, let's let's branch well, out a bit. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. You 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 have a thought. Well, to finish. Two, two, two other points. I mean, one one thing is that, so with all of this stuff, we're going to need to have people who can seriously, adequately test them and and provide useful certification because the FDA, in the large degree, appears not to be interested in providing that service. So that's that's going to be one thing. The other thing you were talking about the NFL. It's interesting. Um, the NFL has announced that they are going to be putting RFID, radio frequency ID trackers, on every player on their Thursday night football games. Um, I don't know if you watched the World Cup soccer coverage this summer or not, but you couldn't miss I it. hadn't seen it before, but they were able to pop up on the screen that so-and-so player had run so many kilometers so far during the game because mm -hmm. they were able to track each, each player individually on the field. Well, they're going to be able to do that uh, for all the NFL players on Thursday night football games. Um, 
they'll be also be able to, you know, in addition to how much distance they covered, it's going to be able to track uh, how fast they're going at any given moment, which gives you their acceleration over time. So you can see how fast they get up to speed. Um, you also will be able to report the distance between any two players. So if you're looking for a, a, a receiver and a defender, you can see how far apart they were, you know, at any given point in the play. And so, as you were saying, you know, the double-edged sword here, one is that's going to give the, the television watching fan a whole lot more information. And it's going to, I think it's going to make the game even more interesting to, to hear about this. On the other hand, and this is something that Formula One drivers have been struggling with for years, it's going to give the coaches a whole lot more information mm -hmm. too. So they're going to know when you're dogging it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and so um, there's you know, no place to hide because all that information will be there. And, you know, Monday morning or Friday morning in this case, you know, all the training staff and the coaches are going to be going over that data with a fine tooth comb, you know, looking for anomalies and, 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 you know, maybe finding an injury that you don't want them to know about or, you know, whatever. So it, it has, it has the potential to change the game significantly. Well, technology has changed the, the game, all of our games, quite a lot over the years anyway. I mean, you know, obviously going as far back as television changed how games were played and it changed how elections are, are run. And, you know, technology does have these kinds of, of, of changing effects. Um, so we're, we're, we're expecting uh, LG is supposed to come out with a round watch and, and the, the Moto 360 is in, in process and everybody's talking well, about health kit and the iWatch. Or, or, do we care? I, I, well, first of all, I, do, I, re, I refuse to talk about any iProduct that has not been announced by Apple. So I, you know, they, I, I, don't, I don't provide them with any extra free publicity about products they haven't talked about. So. Oh, I, um, I make stuff up. In, I mean, I, I write an article almost every year about announcements where I actually tell people I'm making this up based on, right. on, on the, you know, and I'm like, these are completely unfounded rumors that I made up, and people love it. It's just, you know, yep. so, but uh, that they're unfounded and we don't know. And But we do know right. about health kit, so that's something to keep in I, mind. Right. Well, I will say this about watches. I think watches are, um, if they're, they're overrated. I, I think it's um, a probably a self-limiting design. Most of the watch, in spite of miniaturizations, most of the watches that are out there are just so large and clumsy and cumbersome that I can't imagine anybody but the most dedicated techno geek to you know want to be able to put up with it. Um, I think it's a, a necessary interim step. But I think what we're really going to see is um, the network man, for want of a better term. I, 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 you know, it won't be wired. It'll be wireless. But um, uh, I, I believe that what's going to happen is we're going to have components that we wear on our skin, either through patches or something that we strap on or could be even embedded. Um, but those kinds of devices will communicate wirelessly and we won't have some big device that, that we have to strap on our wrists and you know have it be clunky and knock around um, it's interesting along those lines the F the FCC just recently announced uh, its latest rulemaking for the the broadcast of uh, or, you know, the, the, the radio frequencies that will be used to carry these signals um, they're going to be using a very low power section of one spectrum band, which incidentally is shared with the same frequencies that they use to do the telemetry on test pilots of aircraft. So they figured that they probably can keep those two applications far enough apart, but the, the, the pilots get dibs on, on the frequency. So you, you can only use the, the this medical network of devices on a body uh, if it doesn't inter interfere with the other. Unless, of but, course, the, um, the you know, pilot is wired with that stuff. He's, he's wired with that stuff, but they, they use those frequencies to communicate back yeah. to, the, to the ground and, uh, and to record all the, 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 the health information that's going on with the pilot. But, so, yeah, I think that's where we're really headed, um, uh, more so than the watches. 
I, I think I think the future is not in the watch. I think the future is in the data, and yeah, finding out more sense. ways, more ways to gather it better, and more ways to process it more effectively, and and ways to deliver uh, useful analysis that gives people actionable information. Yeah, it's interesting because, like, okay, ever since I was um, able to drive, I stopped wearing watches because I figured my car had a clock in it and I always had my car with me. And then, you know, I started with, with, with handhelds, you know, back in the, in the Sharp Wizard days. And, you know, I carried around a handheld that had a clock with it. And I just never liked watches. And, and my wife and I were having this discussion about three weeks ago about why would anybody possibly want a smartwatch. And then she saw a video about the, the Android Wear and within about a half hour decided she wanted a smartwatch. Now, I haven't seen her wearing mm -hmm. it yet. Um, so that's the, the interesting side of this is, is it hasn't actually been worn, but she thinks it's very cool and, 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 and tells me that she's... She, she tells me she'll get around to using it, but I have to help her figure it out. And I'm just thinking... Right. And, and she, she's a technologically advanced person, um, in the mm -hmm. sense that she's very, very comfortable with new tech and is very comfortable building these things and has written about it and so forth. But even then, the watch didn't go from, I'm, I took it out of its box and I'm using it. It went from, right. I took it out of its box and it didn't quite tell her the recipe she was looking for at the time. And yep. It didn't quite do the things she thought it would do. And so she has to sort of process it in. And, you know, I, I look at this and I look at consumers and, and, and people who need health systems and, and so forth. And I, I have my doubts that any of this stuff is going to go real far. Well, that's, that's why I think the watch is, is a self-limiting solution. Um, I have a gear and I've worn it for a month or two and I don't wear it now. Um, a Galaxy gear. Uh, but, well, take, take for example, there's a company that uh, makes a device that the consumer can just put on their skin with a patch, you know, just strapped to their belly with, with just a, an adhesive patch. The device contains within it a, a hypodermic needle and a safe system where you can insert a vial of medication. And the device is programmed to administer the dosage of that medicine as you need it throughout the day or, or you know, over an extended period of time. Um, this is a tremendous boon for everybody involved because in most cases, when a patient needs that kind of uh, regular injections uh, over a period of time, you, you pretty much have to hospitalize them because you need to put them in, in a, a controlled environment where a technician can come on, a, you know, on the, the right schedule to come give them the right amount of the medication. Uh, with this one, it's it's self-contained. It's it's programmable. They, you strap it on. You forget it. It you know sends you beeps and blinks at when the the, the vial with the medication needs to be replaced. Um, but it's just a uh, you know a huge cost saving and a, a, a huge boost to the quality of life. So I think it's devices like that where there's an immediate benefit um, to the caregivers to the patients to the to the health professionals i think that's like i that's that's the willie sutton quote you know that's where the money's going to be short term mm -hmm. so are devices we, like that are we looking at the the benefits of wearables really for the the very sick in the first few years or are we looking at a broader the very sick or the very you know active are we well, or are we looking at a broader market okay well as with any early adopter you know, you're going to, you, you need to make the technology available to the early adopters who can afford it or who need it. Mm -hmm. um, and so you're absolutely right. It's the, the exercise enthusiast who wants more information about their workouts and so that they can track it better and, and feel that they're being more productive in, in, in their training. And that's, you know, certainly for the amateur athlete, but it, it's very important for the professional athletes. Right. The, the, the professional sports at, at all levels, I mean, uh, tennis, football, all, you know, the full range of sports are all very heavily invested in this kind of monitoring and, and, and tracking of, of, of exercise. But, and as you say, the very sick um, are certainly a, a, 
a market. But the big market, the huge market, is is for the the chronically ill, because those are the ones who really require a lot of expense over time. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't mm -hmm. take much of an efficiency to make huge cost savings by um, you know by coming up with a technology solution. For example, here's a product that's um, under development that I just am fascinated by. So let's take a, a, a chronic condition that is fairly common among the el elderly, and that's loss of hearing. What? Yeah. So um, the, it used to be hearing aids were great big things, and you, know, you had to clip them on or wear them or you know, the hung on your glasses or whatever. I don't know if you're aware of it now, but the, the modern uh, hearing aid fits completely within the, the ear canal. And it's not just a simple amplifier, but they actually tune the, 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 the response curve of the device to the different frequencies where you may have more loss than others. So it only boosts certain frequencies um, of the sounds that are coming in. And all that fits, it's all digitized, and all that fits in this tiny little thing that fits inside your ear canal. Now, they run on batteries. So periodically, you need to take that little tiny thing out, and you need to change those little tiny batteries, um, which is exactly the kinds of skills that an elderly person pretty much doesn't have. Yep. So, so it's a problem. So one of the things that's... Um, been developed or is being developed that it just fascinates me. Uh, do you know the term piezoelectric? Yes. Yeah. Like buzzers okay. and things. Right. So piezoelectric material is something that has a fascinating prop, uh, property. If you have a piezoelectric material and you bend it or, or apply a force to it, it creates an electrical current. Or if you apply an electrical current to it, it'll move. And I tell people, you know, you know, one of the places you can see that is if you have a barbecue, you know, a, a propane grill in the backyard, and you have one of those igniters that clicks yep. when you when you squeeze it, that's a piezoelectric crystal. What you're doing is applying a force to a little crystal in there, and when the for when the crystal gets banged, it makes an electric shock, uh, current that it creates the spark to light the grill. So. Um, so that's what piezoelectrics are. Well, there's a, uh, an outfit that's made a thin film, flexible piezoelectric material to harvest energy. And as it gets bent, it generates a little electrical current. Okay. Mm -hmm. So what they're going to do is they're going to wrap the hearing aid with that kind of material and you put it in your ear. What does that do for you? Well, it turns out that every time you move your jaw, it deforms your ear canal slightly. And that bending creates enough energy that could be harvested to power your, um, to power your, your hearing aid. That's so really you don't have to change the balance. Are you familiar with this? Isn't that cool? Yeah, it is really cool. Are you familiar with the hue bulbs, the, the, the computer-controlled uh, light bulbs that you can change colors yes. with and so forth? Phillips. Yeah, Phillips, yeah. Yep. So I have that. The house has, here, we have, I think we're up to 18 of those things now. And I just bought a little round thing that's called, I think it's called the Hue Tap. And basically, okay. it's it's a $50 light switch. Because now that you have the computer control bulb, you can't walk into a room and turn them on anymore. You have to go hunt for right. your, your smartphone. And so this is a, a, a light switch that you can put where your light switches used to be, so you can now turn on your lights. But the thing yeah. about it is that it doesn't require batteries. It just it, it charges based on the taps. Now, the downside right. of this is I haven't gotten it working yet. I've had it for a couple weeks, and I haven't been able to tell whether or not I need to tap it a whole bunch to make it charge <laughs> because the thing hasn't right. started working yet. But it's really interesting because, you know, you're, we're starting to see some of these technologies that, um, you know, not only will have long-lasting batteries, like like the, the iBeacons out there are now, what, what are they, certified for two or three years of life um, before yeah. you have to change batteries, but we're also starting to see some of these technologies that, you know, use physical motive power to charge themselves, 
but you do have this chicken and egg kind of situation. Like, do you if you put the 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 um the hearing aid in your ear, do you have to like go eat a sandwich before it starts? You know, right, right. do you not hear well, anything until you've had eggs in the morning? Right. <laughs> I mean, it, it, it gets it, it it starts off charged up, and and it does have rechargeable batteries that could be replaced. So, uh, but yes, you're absolutely right. I mean, one of the, to me one of the most exciting things about the whole wearable technology field is this whole topic of energy harvesting, and and it's not just motion, but it's also heat, it's light. There's a, a lot of different ways of of scavenging excess oh and also even radio frequencies because we're bathed in radio frequencies all the time there's um ways of, of harvesting minuscule amounts of energy uh from those radio waves to to power things usefully um so are we really talking but, about concentration of energy it's just that you know uh conservation the fact that energy is out there that we've been dissipating that we can then recover we're not creating new energy we're just you know, ca right. capturing some of the some of the the waste product energy we've had in the past, making more more efficient use of the energy that's available. So here's the one that here's here's an example that just absolutely blows my mind. It's another piezoelectric. So um, there are lots of people with chronic heart disease, and they need to have uh, an implanted pacemaker, and the pacemaker tracks their heart rhythms, and when things start looking like they're getting a little dicey, the pacemaker will inject current and bring the, the, the heart rhythm back to where it needs to be, okay? And they have batteries. And those batteries need to be changed every three to five years. Now, as it turns out, the mortality for people with pacemakers, a huge factor in in the mortality is not the malfunction of the pacemaker or, or a heart problem, but rather complications that arise during the procedures of pulling the pacemaker out and changing the battery. So a lot of these patients would do much better if you could put the pacemaker in and never touch it again. And that's again, a, a, a solution for piezoelectrics. There's a company that has developed a, a thin film plastic piezoelectric material that could that can be um, put on the on the outside wall of the heart, and the heart's natural beating creates enough electricity to keep the pacemaker charged. And this has uh, successfully gone through animal trials, and so I, I believe the product's in clinical trials in humans now. What about um, things like so, like the entropy of of just you know the breakdown of the hardware or the materials, you know, yeah, corrosives on the materials? Does it is there a net gain? Is it you know, like double the survival time, or what do you, th oh, do you think that fits? It would be a lifetime. The, 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 these pacemakers would be a lifetime. Really? Because and the lifetime would be longer, silicon, obviously. Silicon, you know, inert materials um, that the body's not going to reject, and it's just going to, you know, it um, they'll last last forever. You know, last longer than the rest of you will. That's so and it's you know bionic, you know, the bionic body, but um, but again, this is. Uh, you know, sort of, this is as far away from the, you know, the, the, the foot tra tracking wristband as you can get. Um, this is, you know, this is something that does real good for people, you know, keeps them alive and, and eliminates a, a serious source of risk for them. So let's bring this thing in for a bit of a landing because we, we've really covered some very interesting stuff. It's um, almost 2015, so we're, we're three quarters of the way through 2014, um, or just about. Uh, let's go from, let's say, 2015, 2016 up to 2020. What is, what are we looking at in terms of, of wearable tech and health tech, you know, one year out, two years out, five years out, you know, things that we might right. be able to buy next year and things that we'll be able to buy in, in, or, or, you know, have bought for us in, in three to five years? Sure. Um, well, within within a year or two, we are going to see wearable devices that are going to be going to address some serious problems uh, that, that individuals face with chronic conditions. Uh, diabetes is going to be one of the, the real main targets there. But I expect we're also going to see wearable 
products that will address some of the needs of Alzheimer patients, uh, uh, people with uh, uh, tremors uh, like Parkinson's. Um, there are going to be wearable devices that are going to help them compensate with that. We're all also already seeing uh, exoskeleton technology uh, for individual limbs or for you know, large portions of the body. There, there's an exoskeleton that's been approved for consumer use to help uh, paralyzed patients walk again. Pretty um, wild. Let me, is, let, let me interrupt you yeah. for a second. You mentioned Alzheimer's, which sure. doesn't seem like a, a physical uh, type of thing that, you know, some of these physical wearable devices could help. Where, do you, where, where would it fit with Alzheimer's? And then go back to your, you know, up to 20 okay. kind of story. So, so there's a 14-year-old kid whose grandfather has Alzheimer's, and he's living in his home with the kid's aunt, the, the, the grandfather's daughter. And the daughter is trying to provide in-home care for him. And she's doing it by herself. And the only time she can get some rest is at night when the grandfather goes to sleep. Well, with the Alzheimer's, he tends to get up at night and walk around the house and sometimes out of the house. And he can get up and walk around and she's not aware of it. Um, so this 14-year-old kid designed a pair of socks smart socks that the grandfather could sleep in and when he gets out of bed and puts pressure on his feet by standing up it actually sends an alert to the daughter's smartphone wakes her up so that she can come and tend tend to her father that is um, wild it, yeah uh and this is this is a kid who who uh it was a i believe it was a google science uh fair kind of contest and he won first prize for this that is. Um, but he designed he designed the the micro sensors the flexible sensor he he built the you know the the circuit board for the the microchip that drives it you know did the whole thing that's amazing and, and has tested it yeah so yeah so there's a, a very simple example of a very low cost item that could transform that could help an Alzheimer patient remain more independent and provide relief for the caregiver. Um, you know, all through wearable technology. Wow. Socks. So anyhow, so so I see, you know, products like that addressing real problems for real people with chronic conditions. I see that you know, a lot of that coming on in, online in the next year or two. Um, incrementally, I see the, the fitness devices becoming smarter. Already, we're seeing devices that uh, will measure your heart rate accurately without, have, without the need for a, a, an extra chest strap which most of them require at this point. Um, and I also see them beginning to become more accurate in their measurement of other things besides pulse rate, blood oxygen level, uh, blood pressure, um, a number of things that they'll be able to measure uh, in that same strap-on device on your wrist. Um, I see as time goes on, you know, now three, four, maybe four to five years out, uh, I... I see us going away from the compact stereo to the component stereo kind of design, mm -hmm. where we're talking about uh, the sensors becoming physically separated from the controllers, from the communication hub, from the different uh, functional aspects of it. And so you might have one thing that you wear around your neck or on your wrist or somewhere um, that is the, the, the controller but you might have little patches depending on your conditions and what you want to track. You might have a patch on your on underside of your wrist or, or a couple on your chest or on your legs or whatever. And these can check, we'll be able to track everything from, again, those simple blood respiration kinds of things to sequence of muscle firing, to um, uh, motion of, of the different parts of you and with all that kind of information, you can get a much more targeted view of uh, how much exercise you're getting, uh, how efficient it is. Uh, for some sports, knowing that you're moving in the right direction, you'll be able to get a profile of muscle firing sequence that'll show that whether you're doing it right or not. Um, and, and I see those things coming more common in you know the four to five year time span. That is amazing. It's, it's really interesting how we're seeing this stuff happen. 
and how you know the con the confluence of of, of big data uh, along with the, the the increased technology and speed of our systems, along with the ubiquity of smartphones and of course material science, which a lot of us yeah. don't necessarily talk about all that much as a as a substance as a a, do, a thing because we're all busy with looking at processors and computing and so forth. But the the material scientists have been doing some amazing things. It's, well, it's I, I talk about material science at, at every opportunity. Yeah. Uh, there are four kids down at NC State right now who have developed uh, a nail polish that detects date rape drugs in a drink. Wow. So a young woman, you know, wearing the nail polish just has to stir her drink with her fingertip very discreetly, and it will tell her whether or not there's something in there that shouldn't be. That's both disturbing and incredibly amazing. Yeah. Well, it, it returns control to the victim. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, you know, and, and puts puts the potential perpetrator on guard as as the one who you know now not in control yeah. and you know could be at risk. Absolutely, absolutely. It's it's a shame that this is a problem that people have to to guard against, but it's great to have tools to guard against it. Um, and, it and it's four guys who came up with it. That's that's awesome. That's awesome. So let's uh, why don't we tell why don't you tell people what you're up to and and where to find you and things like that sure. and we okay. can uh, we can wrap this I think this has been a fascinating discussion and well thank uh, you so much so tell everybody where you are where to find you where you're at all that good stuff sure okay so you can find the uh, the the blog about all of this it, you know I've just scratched the surface of some of the the topics that we've covered in the last couple of weeks. Um, You'll find it at healthtechinsider.com, healthtechinsider.com. And uh, you can reach me uh, if you have questions or, you know, want to set, drop me an email. You can reach me at alfred at centerringmedia.com or the, a shorter one, it's easier to remember, is APOR, like Alfred Poor, A-P-O-O-R at verizon.net. And you can also find me on Twitter as uh, at Alfred Poor. I'm also on LinkedIn, Facebook. Um, Google Plus, and so I'm active on the social channels. Um, would welcome to hear the, the opportunity to hear from you. And again, Health Tech Insider is a free site. It's a free newsletter. Uh, if you're interested, come on the site, sign up for the newsletter, and tell your friends. That is just great. Uh, so let's uh, let's let's bring this thing in uh, for a landing. I want to thank Alfred for joining us. Um, he is one of my, my favorite people to talk to, and he's always interesting. Uh, let's bring you up into the corner again. There we are. Um, Alfred, again, thank you so much for your time. Uh, we're making a slight change to our, our closing credits because uh, this, this project for DIYIT has been called the Skype Studio, and we're starting to, I'm trying to start using other technologies. So since I'm in the Space Coast, the, the ending credit's now going to show Space Coast Studios. We'll see if that works. But uh, again, I want to thank you so much for, for being available and for being flexible and for being so fascinating. Hopefully we'll get Alfred back on uh, to do another one of these and, and dive in further. But in the meantime, you've got a bunch of places to find him. Uh, and uh, again, Alfred, thank you. My pleasure. Thanks so much for giving me the time. You got it. All right. Let's, I think I'm about to pop him back in and back on. Okay, let's, uh, let's roll our credits.